Good day. You know, there's a theory out there that four were crucified with Jesus Christ, and not just one, and that they were crucified on stakes, not crosses. This idea of four crucified dates back apparently to E.W. Bollinger somewhere around the year 1900. And then it was picked up by Victor Paul Wirrell of the Way International, although he seemed to imply it was his theory rather than Bollinger's. Now here's seven facts about four crucified. Number one, the word for never appears in any of the Gospels. It never appears. Now, each of the Gospels, remember, were written to stand alone, to have everything you needed to know about Christ to believe. Not everything there is to know, but everything you needed to know. And so Luke writes to Theophilus. You know, maybe Luke should have included a footnote that says, Oh, Theo, I'm sorry. I said two were crucified. You'll have to wait till John writes his gospel 40 years from now. Compare them in detail side by side to figure out there's actually four. I'm sorry. I, I misled you. No, he doesn't write that. Each of the gospels in it is decided to stand alone. And so when they say two crucified, they mean two. Remember that the New Testament is not a single book with many chapters within it. The New Testament is an anthology. There are many different books and letters inside of it, which are just gathered together for our convenience, but each one stands on its own. And it's impossible to find four in any individual book. Okay, number two. The Gospels are not intended to be a, you know, Joe Friday, dragnet, police kind of report in which things are logged moment by moment. Beep. Rather, it's telling a story with accurate facts, but not meant to be strictly chronological and not meant to be exact quotations of each thing or person they quote. Now, this is just normal for us. Let's say you told the story about what you did yesterday. You said, well, I went to the mall, I bought shoes. Um, I saw Santa, and there was a sign saying you could take pictures with Santa. But then, later on to someone else, you tell the same story, and it sounds different. Well, I went to the store uh, with my wife, I saw Christmas decor, uh, bought some boots, and uh, there was a sign saying Santa would be there until December 24th. Now, all those facts are true. They don't contradict unless you want to contradict, because, you know, a shoe is a boot. Okay, a boot is a shoe. So it's only contradictory unless you force it to be. And the Gospels are the same way. They aren't meant to be a police report, but rather telling the story with true facts, not exactly chronological, not exactly matching from Gospel to Gospel, but being true, and not giving exact quotes in all cases. So the crucifixion account in the Gospel was not meant to be, you know, a, a log, you know, 851, arrived Golgotha, 904, divided the close. Okay, it's not written that way. In fact, the gospel accounts of the crucifixion are just between about six and eight paragraphs, really short. They're more like giving the highlights of a conference or the highlights of a football game. The important events are there, it's accurate, the meaning is there, but all the precise quotes aren't. Okay, number three. Bollinger and, and where we'll add words, especially words about number and time, which are not in any of the Gospels. They're not there. They're adding words. So they'll say, like, uh, two were crucified on one side and two on the other. That's not a word that's in the New Testament. They'll use the word for. There's not that word in the Gospels. They'll use time words like after, before, later finally, which are not in any of the Gospels, and if you remove those words, everything falls apart. In Greek, it's more like they have a run-on sentence, and, 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 and they divide the clothes, and they sat down, and they put on thorns, and some people insulted him. Even some words that are time-like words, like meta and tata, sometimes translated then, don't necessarily refer to a particular point in time, although they might. They often refer to a block of time. That's the way we use the word too. We said, well, I did it then, meaning sometime yesterday morning, or back then, which was yours over. Okay, so they add words about time and numbers that the Gospels don't. Fact four. Their definition of other, that is the Greek words alus and heteris, are bogus. Now, they have to have this exotic, seemingly contradictory translations of these two words in order to get the idea of for crucified, otherwise it falls apart. Now, in fact, if you compare the Gospels, 
Um, the words Alice and Hedris are virtually interchangeable. In fact, you find the same story in more than one gospel, in which one gospel uses the word Hedris and the other uses the word Alice. Now, they couldn't do that if they were contradictory or contrasting definitions the way Werwell and Bullinger describe them. Uh, for instance, the parable of the sower. Um, Mark and Matthew use the word Alice. Luke uses the word Hedris. Okay, so these aren't contradictory definitions. In fact, it's more author preference. What you'll find is that the book of Mark uses the word Alice 23 times, Hedris only once. By contrast, Luke uses, in Acts and the Gospel, he uses the word Hedris 50 times, seldom uses the word Alice. It's primarily author preference, not contrasting definitions. Fact five, uh, Werwell and Bollinger have convoluted stories that add actions that are not in the Gospels. For instance, they have three signs that are on Jesus' cross, you know, as though they go up, down, up, down, up, down three times, or that uh, Peter denied Christ six times. They take a simple story and make it complex, convoluted, confused. Fact six about four crucified. The signs and people are typically paraphrased or quoted partially rather than in their entirely exact word for word. For instance, you compare the two trials, accounts of Jesus' trial. The high priest says something in slightly different wording in one gospel as opposed to the other. Well, he's just being paraphrased and not everything he says is quoted there. We know that. And so you can't change the approach as Werwell and Bullinger do and suddenly expect everything has to be an exact quote. The meaning is there, the substance is there, but the quotes are sometimes partial or paraphrased. So with the sign of Jesus, King of the Jews, that's the point of the gospel that even this hostile witness, Pilate, uh, had this thought. He's King of the Jews. Okay, well, Mark has the shortest version, which isn't surprising because he's the shortest gospel. He has King of the Jews. Matthew makes it a little longer. Jesus, King of the Jews. John has the longest version. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. All of them are just paraphrasing or quoting parts of the sign. They aren't quoting exactly three different signs. You don't need to make something contradictory when it's not. Okay, last fact, seven. Number seven, about four crucified. A malefactor is a robber. Now, Bollinger and Ware will admit that, yeah, robbers are malefactors, and yet they go the extra step of saying, and these stories, they have to be opposite, completely different titles for different people. Well, that's just not true. Um, you know, are there two Barnabases, uh, I'm sorry, two Barabbases, because one is described as a murderer and the other is an insurrectionist? Well, no, he was both. Are there two different Pauls because he's described sometimes as servant and sometimes as apostle? Well, no. These are two titles for the same person. Okay, so these titles aren't meant to be opposites. Rather, um, they are broad. They include each other. These titles supplement each other. They add something to the story. They don't contradict. Okay, and these are seven facts about four crucified. Now, why is this important or significant? Firstly, it's significant because Victor Paul Worrell claims he's basically the only source of truth since the Apostle Paul. Everyone is just tradition. He alone teaches the truth. And then you find this kind of error in that. His claim isn't true. Secondly, Worrell and Bullinger are spreading a faulty way of understanding the Gospels. Instead of seeing them as complementary accounts, which don't have to have exact quotes, they tease them and make things contradictory which are meant to be supplementary. It's a bad approach. So we learned that Victor Werwell isn't a reliable teacher. If this was a class, he'd get an F in his class. There's a better way to interpret the Gospels, to see them as complementary accounts, not contradictory accounts, and to have it with that approach and see the unity that is in them as they describe the story the important story of the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ Jesus. Good day.